Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector. He would argue with Paul today in heaven. He was the chief of sinners, I'm sure. The Bible says he was rich and he sought to see who Jesus was but could not because of the crowd for he was of short stature so he ran ahead and climbed up in the sycamore tree to see Jesus, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained. There's always a buzzkill around, isn't there? Oh, there's always a Pharisee around every corner. They complained saying, he has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. I say amen to the Pharisees. Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Lord, look, if I have given, I will give half of my goods to the poor. And if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, I love this. Today, salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham, here it is, say it out loud, church. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Hallelujah. Don't you love that truth? Only Jesus can find something when it's lost. Do you know the first question in the Bible that Jesus asked in Genesis chapter 3 in the Garden of Eden was, where are you? Him who seeks and saves the lost was already seeking out those that were lost. But the thing is, Adam and Eve, they didn't even quite know they were lost when they were approaching the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Do you know what's worse than being lost is being lost and not knowing that you're lost. When the revelation comes that you're lost, it's an opportunity to get found. You ever been lost? It's a scary feeling. Most of us are like the man driving the car who refuses to stop and ask for directions, who says, I'm not lost. <laughs> it's the truth, right? When I was thinking about being lost, I came across an interesting story online. Some of you might have heard about the guy who got swallowed by a whale. Michael Packard, I think his name is. This guy was... Massachusetts diving for lobster and a humpback whale swallows him whole. Interesting day for Michael, right? What's the thing is, and you've, there's different interviews online that I saw, interesting ones all, but the guy was wearing scuba gear. So imagine being inside the mouth of this humpback whale, but you're breathing because you've got a respirator. What's going through your mind? Well, for Michael, it was like, there's no way I'm getting out of this thing with brute force. I'm not going to pry the mouth of this big fish open. Now, for, when, I, listen, when I first heard about it, I read the ad, I said, something seems fishy about this. Sorry, <laughs> the inner tie came out in me. I'm sorry. But as I watched the interview, I go, this is the real deal. This really happened. They didn't, they didn't see where he got swallowed. They saw where like a minute later, the whale came up and spit him up out of his mouth. So he never was digest in stomach, but just in his mouth. But one of the things he says is when I was in there, I realized there's nothing I can do to save myself. Either I'm going to die or by God's mercy, I'm going to get out. But there's nothing I can do. Let me tell you what. I believe that type of desperation of lostness to be found was exactly what Zacchaeus was going through. The guy had everything 
He was the chief tax collector. The dude was rich, but he realized there's nothing in of myself I can do to fulfill myself. I need Jesus. I need him. It's an incredible testimony when you go through where the world swallows you up in darkness and you're just going, I, I literally see how there's nothing I can figure out, maneuver, spend, ask help from anybody else. The only way I'm gonna survive this lostness, this darkness, this depression I'm in is if God supernaturally does something. A lot of people don't believe that because quite frankly, they're super impressed with themselves. And some of them have good reason, very gifted, very intelligent, very resourceful. But you know what? God is looking for you to simply say, I'm lost. When he asked Adam and Eve, where are you? What they should have said is, lost. (laughs) And we don't know our way back. God is desiring that type of humility that Zacchaeus had, that's childlike. Can you imagine seeing a grown man? Can you imagine seeing Pastor Norm climbing a tree? I mean, you know, see, I didn't say me because I really want to really dig in deeper there, you know? Though that, because I'm such a goofball, that might not be too out of the ordinary. But Pastor Norm climbing a tree, that'd be a sight. But if it was with one of his grandkids, you'd go, oh, okay. I kind of get it, but Norm, be careful, right? Zacchaeus is climbing a tree, but even more so, it's so uncustomary for a grown man to be so childlike in his faith. But see, before someone's lost, and I love this quote from John Calvin, he says, the foundation of faith is childlike curiosity and simplicity. That's good. Before ever someone can be delivered from their lostness, There needs to be a childlike simplicity to go, God, I need you. I can't do this without you. Jesus said in the chapter, previous chapter, he said, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them for such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. Something happened in Zacchaeus where he's like, I I need help, and I don't care what anyone thinks of me. I don't care what kind of fool I look like. You know, a lot of people don't ask questions because they don't want to look stupid. I got news for you. We're all stupid. Every one of us. I don't care what degree you have on your wall, what algebra you can do, trigonometry. I don't care what you think you know. Compared to almighty, omniscient God, you're an idiot. Every one of us, it's like, don't we worry about being embarrassed? Zacchaeus was there. I wonder how long it took him to get to that place. What happened in Zacchaeus where he's like, I don't care about, not only what people think of me, a chief tax collector is not, the the smart thing to do is to not be walking around a crowd of people that want to kill you. So he didn't care how he looked. He didn't care what people would do to him. He was so desperate to get out of this dark life that the world says, you've got everything you need. He's going, I don't have anything I need. I need Jesus to come into my house and to abide and to be comfortable, literally the word means, to be comfortable here. I need Jesus. When you get to that place, it's incredible. Something, as I'm pondering on this, like what happened? Zacchaeus, what did he hear? Because surely he heard something about Jesus, right? And news traveled fast. I'm so glad that Pastor Jesus didn't move around in a jet. He walked. See, by the time he got to the next town, the news had been there quite a while of everything that he had done. So he's traveling from Galilee heading down to Jerusalem from the top of Israel, which ironically is interesting because that's actually going up. So that's a great metaphor. Actually going down for the Lord is actually going up with God. Amen? He's actually heading down towards Jerusalem, and he's passing through Jericho. This is where this terrible place, it's actually considered to be the lowest geographical spot on earth and land. 
And this is where Jesus is going to the lowest part of the world to find the chief of sinners who's been broken and humbled and is desperate like a child to say, Jesus, I need you. But he already heard about Jesus. He already heard about publicans, tax collectors, Pharisees, Sadducees, hearing the word of God, some being hardened, some being blessed, some getting bitter. And I believe he had heard the trilogy of parables that Jesus had told just a few chapters beforehand. I want to read to you this trilogy of parables that our sovereign God puts before us to display his heart as a seeker, to display his heart as him who finds us. I want to know God's heart. And you know, once you know God's heart, you can somehow... Get blinded to his heart. Once you know you, who you are in him, you can get spiritual amnesia and forget who you are in him. Turn with me, if you would, to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. The three parables I speak of are the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the lost son. Just for your ability to grasp a hold of these and retain some of the things I'm sharing with you today, I want you to consider this trilogy, this tripod of truth, if you would. The son seeks me. Say that out loud. The son seeks me. When we look at that parable, that's what God wants you to get. When we look at the parable of the lost coin, I want you and say this out loud, the spirit finds me. The spirit finds me. See, when you came and encountered God, it wasn't the physical body of God, was it? It was the spirit of the living God, the spirit of Christ, who is the Holy Spirit. That's the point, really, of the lost coin. And lastly, a parable that we all know that's been called the best short story to ever be written in human history, the parable of the lost son, which we're going to look at, the point of that being, the Father's love restores me. Say that out loud. The Father's love restores me. Look with me at this incredible parable of the lost sheep, Luke 15. It says, all the tax collectors and sinners drew near to him. Don't you love that verse? Oh, my gosh. It says, and the Pharisees and the scribes complained. Somebody say contrast, right? There it is. And what were they saying? This man receives sinners and eats with them. I've never amen the Pharisees so much over the last couple days. They're saying it for the wrong reason, but what they're saying is right on, amen? So they're looking at what Jesus is doing, and they're going, man, what is he doing? doing he's sitting with sinners he's going into their house he's he's eating with them and the contrast is the chief publicans the tax collectors like Zacchaeus to come in the next town that he's in they're saying I'm lost and I need Jesus I'm in utter darkness and unless God does something I'm going to get swallowed up and I'm going to die in this misery and this blackness and this darkness I need help now the Pharisees they're coming, and they don't know that the enemy has blinded them to the goodness and the grace of God because of a simple and yet deadly sin called pride. We'll come back to that. When this happened, Jesus spoke the parable saying, what man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing it. When he comes, he calls together his friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me. For I have found my lost sheep, which has been lost. I say to you that likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 Pharisees. They're listening to him saying this. They know that they're the 99. Talk about 
egg in your face. Their brain is egg on a frying pan listening to Jesus talk. He's trying to display to them his heart of, listen, mercy. Mercy. God is a God of mercy. Do you ever get up and just go, God, thank you that you don't give me what I deserve. You're on your way to being found praying like that. And listen, for those of you who say, you don't understand, Pastor, I, I got found years ago. Don't you think you can't get lost again? Don't think you can't turn into the older brother. I love the picture of God rejoicing. Do you ever think about God laughing? I mean, so often we picture God, we think of God as sovereign and solemn and almost stoic and, right? I mean, you know, Ten Commandments, Charlton Heston. I mean, that's the, that's the image. But do you ever think of God like jumping up and down and dancing and singing and rejoicing over you? Because he does, right, Zephaniah? He dances over you. He sings over you. When you start, God, God the Son, the one who seeks us, he goes, I want you to think of, of, of God. And I'm going to be a picture because if you've seen me, you've seen the Father of rejoicing when you get found. And I love the picture he has. You notice it says that when the Son, the good shepherd, comes and finds the lost lamb, he doesn't say, what are you doing? Haven't I told you not to go out? Haven't I told not at all. He finds him, he rejoices, and he says, I know that you're tired from your wayward going astray. That's why a sheep gets lost, by the way. Matthew 18, it says, because the sheep goes astray. Going the wrong way. So the shepherd says, I, I could rebuke you. I could smack you. I could say, forget, I'm not leaving you. I got 99. It's a bad business decision to leave 99 for one, right? God's economy is very different. And so he says, I'm going to pick you up and put you on my shoulder and carry you back the right way. Hallelujah. I mean, when you go astray, do you picture God coming and giving you a hug and saying, I love you. Can I pick you up? Because I want to bring you back where you need to be. But I know you're too tired to get there because you've been walking the wrong way. So now let me help you go the right way. Oh, you can't. No problem. You can't. Oh, so you can't get where you need to be without me, says the Lord. I love that. See, under the law, man, I, I've got to pay back. I've got to do this. I've got to achieve. I've got to keep the law. I can do that for you. If you just confess that you're lost and that you went astray and that you want to be in my fold, says the Lord. I don't care how long you've been saved you can find yourself entering into the joy of God by simply humbling yourself when you wake up in the morning and go, God, I just can't do anything without you. And whenever I stress, it's a sign of delusions of Godhood. Do you believe that? It's true. Stress makes you do stupid things. It makes you believe you're the Holy Spirit and you got to, you're going to do it on your own and, and you just get egg in the face, don't you? It doesn't work out. I love the Father's joy when he just picks me up because I submit to his lordship. That's really what these stories are about. It's about the joy of, of the Father finding us, isn't it? You know, I was at the mall this Friday, had an incredible encounter with God, but I'm sitting there, I'm actually thinking about the scripture and lost being found, and, and I took, Kathy and I took uh, um, Leah to, we, we had some fun stuff, we went to see a cool movie, and we went out to have, uh, spent some time with friends, we went to California Kitchen, because they make amazing pizza, and that butter cake with ice cream is incredible, oh my gosh, yeah, so it's just, it's, we like to go there. So we're taking Leah there, and as we're sitting there, and she's drawing, she sees this man and this woman with their two young kids come in, and she hears it's their birthday. And so Leah starts to make a happy birthday card for them. I, I know. Is she ridiculous sweet? All right. Oh, my gosh. So all my grandkids are, by the way. They're perfect. Yours are not. Mine are. Sorry. It's my, mine are the best. Mine are the best. <laughs> kidding. Kidding. Kind of. <laughs> I don't want to lie while I'm up here. Um, so, so, so Leah's like making this card, and she says to the waiter, Matt, Matt, can you take this to that girl over there? And, and Kathy's like, oh, my 
gosh, that's because Kathy is the card queen. She is the card queen, man. She sends out these prophetic cards that are ridiculous. Oh, my gosh. So I guess there's an anointing moving in my granddaughter. But she writes this card. She sends it over there, and, and the family's really blessed. And then we see her open up, the seven-year-old. And here's a picture of them. You can see the three of them here. And, and, and so they're opening up this gift, this, this little doll, and she's just so jazzed about it. And, and we know we're going to the slime place next because kids love slime, right? Got any slime lovers in the house, right? It's like a Nickelodeon thing. Maybe you've seen it on TV, right? Where they make slime, do all kinds of good. That's a wall of slime behind them, by the way. Pretty slime, at least. It's not green mucus slime. It's like pretty slime. It's got sparkles in it, right? So she invites little Sophia to come and, and enjoy some slime with her. And I'm talking with their dad about this gift, this little doll that she was just ecstatic when she got it. And I hear the story that... that Two years ago when she was five, she lost this little doll that she had since she was born. And she was heartbroken, heartbroken. And the parents tried to buy a new one. Of course, they didn't make it anymore. Tried to find a used one, eBay. Just could not find it, and she was heartbroken. Just a couple months before her seventh birthday, they just happened to find the doll behind some boxes in storage. And so instead of giving it to her there, they decided to give it to her at the birthday at California Kitchen. And so he's telling me this story. And I'm sitting there, like, at the slime place, like, tearing up, like, oh, my gosh, this is so incredible. You know, like, this is amazing. But the part that blew my mind is the dad's going, I don't know who had more joy, her getting it or me getting to give it to her. It's like the joy of a father just going, I know you thought this was lost, but I found it. I'm your hero. <laughs> You know, it's just like, that's just like this little speck of example of what it's like when Jesus says, oh, you were lost. You never thought you'd get found. But see, it's even bigger than that because you know what's interesting about sheep? Everyone thinks sheep are stupid. They're not stupid. They're stubborn. There's a difference. But the thing is about sheep that are different. Like if a dog gets lost, many times that dog will work its way back to where the owner is in the home, right? Not a sheep. Because sheep don't even know they're lost. I kid you not. When the shepherd finds them, oh, well, I'm fine. But there's wolves on me around me. I'm about to be dinner for wildlife, but I'm fine. And that's the way most of us are. Hey, I'm about to be dinner for Satan and demons all around me, destroying my life and violating my mind, but I'm fine. You're lost. You're lost. And the, and the Lord's like, now, my question is, Lord, why would you even want to save People like that. Why are you even talking to these chief sinners and Pharisees and Sadducees? And there's, there's only one reason. You ready what it is? Because he loves them. There it is. Do you need anything else besides that as an answer? That's the only answer I need. It's because he loves us and he's the son who seeks out the lost. Oh, man, I love this passage concerning the good shepherd and Israel, God's people, in Ezekiel 34. It says, for thus says the Lord God, indeed, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd who seeks out his flock on the day he is among his scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep and deliver them from all the places where they have scattered on a cloudy and dark day. I will feed my flock and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek what was lost and bring back what was driven away, bind up the broken and strengthen what was sick. But I will destroy the fat and the strong and feed them in judgment. Therefore, I will save my flock, listen, and they shall no longer be prey. Hallelujah. That's our good shepherd. He's so good. They shall no longer be prey, meaning they're out there amongst wolves, savage wolves, and they don't even know it. They're so lost, says the Lord. Let me tell you what, on this trip that I took, going to quite a few states, I experienced some deep, dark lostness. See, like some of you in this room, I live in a Christian bubble. I keep 
things on my TV pure. I'm primarily working with the people of God, equipping them for the work of the ministry. And I'm not the evangelist that I was maybe in my 20s and 30s out in the street, out in the mission field. The season of life, this is what I do. This is my calling. This is my mission. But it keeps me in that bubble. God took me out of the bubble. I didn't like it, but I needed it. Someone says, you got to go down to downtown Nashville, Pastor Dave. You and Kathy, you'll like it because you can walk down and down, and they have all the open storefronts with all the windows and all the bands playing in the different places, and it's just really amazing. Well, being a musician, that was intriguing. This sounds good. Kathy and I drive down there, and we notice on our way that there's like a lot of buses that have the top cut off. They're called party buses. They're basically mobile bars. And they're all over the place in Nashville. And as you drive down these streets, it's like Sodom and Gomorrah on steroids. I mean, it, it's not only the people in the bus, the way they're acting, drinking, the way they're dressed, the way they're talking. It, it's like even all the people around the bus are looking at the bus like they're watching a rock concert going, yeah, you go for it, you alcoholic, that's awesome. How drunk can you get? How wasted can you get? How foolish can you get? Yes, and amen. And we're watching this and we're just like, we're uncomfortable. I was uncomfortable. I'm like, you know what? We're out of here. We're out of here. This is, this, this is not what we came to vacation and <laughs> experience. We're not walking down the street of Sodom and Gomorrah today. That's just not what we're supposed to be doing. And, and we left, and, and then we went to several different places, but we found ourselves in St. Petersburg, traveling back down the West Coast to see some family, and, and, and we noticed that, that it's Pride Month. See, we don't, Kathy and I don't watch the news. We used to, but I decided to not kick myself in the face every day, you know, and get so caught up in civilian affairs that I don't keep my focus on the gospel. Well, and, and I say amen to that too, and I still stand by that. At the same time, there's a place of sticking your head in the dirt and not knowing what's going on, like say Elijah knew what was going on in Ahab's bedroom. I mean, and he was a politician, Ahab, right? So I mean, there's a place to know what's going on, to know how to pray, how to pray, how to walk, right? It's a fine line, and, and, and really the, only the Holy Spirit can tell you where that's at. So when someone tries to tell you where that line is, let them know they're not the Holy Spirit, and, and you're praying about it, and the Lord will direct you, and they should bless that, you know? But for me, I had the extreme, so I'm not even aware about it being Pride Month, and, and I'm going, what, what a word. What a word. We're in the, because we're in the, this restaurant, they're on the intercoastal, and I just see the rainbow flags everywhere, and so I, I you know, I kind of know what it's about, you know, I'm not that ignorant, but I just thought I'd come and watch, ask the hostess, so what's the rainbow flags about? And the hostess says, it's Pride Month. It's like, Pride Month. And all that went through my mind is Proverbs 16 that says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughtiness before a fall. That was the problem with the Pharisees. Pride. They were wise in their own eyes. The scripture goes on, which we really don't usually read, verse 17. It says, better to live humbly with the poor than share plunder with the proud. Those who listen to instruction will prosper. Those who trust in the Lord will be joyful. Amen. Oh, man. Don't you love that, right? It's like, I, I don't want to think that I'm smarter than God, that somehow Dr. Ruth knows more than the great physician who gave me the Bible. I, I, I know some of you are too young. You have no idea who that is, do you? <laughs> Point being is there's a lot of worldly counsel out there 
to engage in fulfilling your flesh that's contrary to what the Lord says. It's a real cross sort of life. Pastor Ty has taught on worldview versus a biblical worldview the last three weeks, and it's like there's an epidemic in the church as to what God sees and how he sees things and, and what's right and what's wrong. Because there really is a right and a wrong, by the way. It's not your truth and my truth. It's his truth. He is the truth, you see. But the enemy is constantly wanting to twist and pervert the heart and message and invitation of God to be found. And if we sit there and well up in our pride, you see what happens. As I'm, and this gets definitely personal, um, as I continue to see rainbow flags everywhere I go, I was, do you know what the word I'm gonna use? Yeah, it's the right word, disgusted. Just disgusted with the perversion of God's order. I'm sitting here having dinner with my wife and one of my sons and his girlfriend, and we're sitting at this table, and, and through the glass window next to us, there's two girls sitting there, and as I'm talking to my kids and my wife, um, all of a sudden these two girls start French kissing. And in mid-sentence as I'm talking, I'm like, oh, just, jeez. I mean, just in my face. And then God began to work. Look at this picture of Jesus with someone that he loves. Don't you love that? Don't you love that? Now, some of you are going, I don't know if I love that. Because Jesus said to the woman who sinned, go and sin no more. So after you met Jesus, did you go and sin no more? I guess you better drop that stone. This was a piece of artwork that was put up online by a band called Seventh Day Slumber, and uh, they toured around a church's new ministry, and quite a few churches dropped them after they put this up. Yeah. Self-righteous. As I sat there at dinner, I was self-righteous. Jesus would have got up from the table and went over there and prayed for them. And instead, I judged them. But God's forgiven me. He's good. He's good. I repented. I repented and said, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that, that I did that. And I was talking to one of the pastors yesterday who was talking to someone who, who is uh, Transgender. They claim, identify as transgender, and, and they asked, asked him and said, so is Reveal Fellowship a LGBTQ-friendly church? And he says, definitely not. <laughs> and how he meant to answer that, I would agree with him, but as a whole, my answer is absolutely. Absolutely. I've been asked so many times, what would you do, Pastor Dave, if two guys we're sitting up front that we're gay. I'd, I'd say, praise God. Just as I, two guys that were sitting up front that were lawyers, praise God. <laughs> well, what would you do if two girls were sitting there and they started to make it out in the front row? The same thing I do if a woman and a man who were married started making out in the front row. It's inappropriate. Deal with it. But we want to be a hospital for sinners, right? Because Jesus said, I came to seek and save the lost. So if Jesus is abiding and he's comfortable in me, then he's seeking and saving the lost through me. So am I a Zacchaeus? Jumping up and down like with childlike joy, hallelujah, I was lost, but now I'm found. Or have I reverted back to my pharisaical fears? Hmm. Don't act like you're not convicted. We 
we are to have compassion on the lost and humility that we were lost and that we could be lost tomorrow. When I say lost, just for you Bible theologians, I'm not trying to say losing your salvation. I'm talking about losing sight of Jesus, backsliding, getting to the place where you lost your first love flame, where you're no longer walking in grace but back under law again. You don't think that can't happen? It happens all the time to Christians. And, and, and the symptoms of that is when someone comes in waving their rainbow flag that you are disgusted versus you have compassion and empathy and you care. And you're willing to have a conversation. And you're willing to trust it's the Holy Spirit who moves in people, not your intellect. Only God can find somebody. Only God seeks them out. Never you, never me. Always him, maybe through you, through me, but it's always him, hallelujah. And I love giving him all the glory. It brings me great joy to bring him the glory. And so you need to understand that right now we live in a world that is is frankly, it's a, it's a mess, is it not? It's a mess. I mean, the whole thing with the rainbow, I remember when I was developing a curriculum for New Beginnings back in the um, early 90s, that church I went to, and, and I remember it, it was called New Beginnings, and it had a picture of a rainbow on the front of it. And I remembered one of the pastors going, ah, I'm not sure you want to use that rainbow because uh, the, the enemy, you know, he's really kind of, captured and kidnapped that for a different agenda. And here I'm in my early 20s and I'm kind of like, I didn't even know what he was talking about because it, you know, it wasn't that known, honestly. Because the rainbow for me is, if you haven't studied much on it, here's a picture of a rainbow. I love that. Don't you love looking at a rainbow? My wife is always someone, whenever there's a storm, and that's the byproduct of, right, a storm, a rainbow, is when there's a storm and the sun breaks through, hallelujah, and there's a rainbow, and there's a promise behind it. Every time Kathy's like, oh, honey, turn around. We need to get a picture of the rainbow. She's just like childlike when it comes to the rainbow, you know? And to think the enemy wants to use that and put the word pride next to it? Oh my gosh, it's based on a promise in Genesis 9 where God destroyed the earth with water. Where he says, I'll never destroy all of humankind and animals, everything, with water ever again. It's a promise. It's a picture of a bow with no arrow. In other words, the arrow's already shot. No judgment will come in this way again. So those of you worried about global warming and ice caps melting and the earth flooding, God said it ain't gonna happen. That will never happen. Now the earth will be destroyed with fire, by the way. That will happen. But it's interesting, this beautiful promise of judgment that passes by that the enemy wants to take this incredible symbol and use it for deception. Now see, if, if you're here today or you're listening online and you're going, Dave, I'm a Christian, I love Jesus, and I am transgender. I am homosexual, I am queer, I'm a lesbian, I'm pan, I'm non-binary. Man, there's, there's so much stuff today I'm hearing makes my head spin, frankly. But if, if that's you, I want you to know Jesus doesn't condemn you. He loves you. He's not mad at you. He's not angry at you. I'm sorry that people like me and other people in this room or people in your family have misrepresented the son who seeks you out. Forgive us. Forgive us for failing to represent Jesus the right way. I've actually cried about this. It's broken my heart. Like, Lord, gosh, I sit there across from my son totally. I didn't say anything. Praise God I had the self-control not to say something. You know, but I, but I was like, man, I really misrepresented you, Jesus. I'm sorry. And, and so I would just say to anyone, listen, forgive us as God's kids for misrepresenting his heart. And, and that anything that we're talking about along those lines is not to condemn you. Right now, what I'm sharing is not to condemn you. I mean, it, it's, it's only the enemy condemns. Only the enemy condemns. God doesn't condemn, you see. Not in this world. There's opportunity for salvation for all those that are lost to be found right now. I don't care what you've done, how far you've gotten off. Man, you can be found in Jesus. Isn't that glorious? No matter how far off you've gotten down that wrong road, man, the Lord can bring you back. No matter how many memories you've put in your head that they've just built up so much shame that the only answer was to go into denial. 
the only answer to deal with the pain of the shame was to build up a worldly philosophy to justify it. And you know you're lying to yourself. I mean, I could come up here with a bunch of scientific facts and this and that, and, and we can argue back and forth, but that's really pointless, I believe. Not that there's no credence or purpose in looking at some of those things. It's just as I prayed about it, I'm like, I don't think that's what I'm called to do today. But what I am called is to say, you know what the truth is, deep down. You know what's right, and you know what's wrong. You know what's natural, and you know what's unnatural. No matter what the world tells you, no matter what your feelings tell you, you know, don't you? The real issue is not whether you're a male or female. You can take a shower and figure that out pretty quick, right? I mean, honestly, that's not trying to be disrespectful. It's just, it's reality. And so if I come to you, someone in this church who's claiming to be transgender or I'm homosexual or I'm a lesbian or this or that, you need to know my heart as a minister, one who represents the son who seeks, I'm not here to beat you up. I'm not here to condemn you. I'm here to let you know that there is a world pandemic of deception going on like we've never seen in any other time in history. Nothing like it. And some of the things I'm going to present to you today, for some of you in this room, are going to be shocking. You're going to be like, are you kidding me? I didn't realize it was this bad. But I hope you won't be disgusted. I hope that you'll have empathy and compassion and someone who says, I want to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Now, I said to you that there's a world pandemic of deception going on, and the enemy is trying to use God's rainbow to actually spearhead this. I read this online that many of you were aware of. It was a proclamation from our White House, from our president, Joseph R. Biden Jr. No, he's your president. He is. Don't say he's not. Because God is sovereign. Yes, he is. Amen. Nero was the Caesar God chose in Paul's day. God's big. He's doing something even when it looks like the enemy is totally in control. Like, for example, it says here, President, I, the President of the United States, by virtue of the authority vested in me by the Constitution of the United States, do hereby proclaim June 2021 as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer pride month. I call upon the people of the United States to recognize the achievements of the LGBT community and to celebrate the great diversity of the American people and to wave their flags of pride high. This is where we're at today in America. What do we do with that? I, amen, we pray, right? We pray and we love those that are under attack and being deceived. Not condemn them, love them, right? It's an opportunity to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to go sit with sinners. And remember that you're a sinner too. See, it's a lot easier when you're ministering to a couple that are living together in sin when you remember, wait a minute, I had sex before I got married too. Isn't it amazing the people that will condemn Seventh-day Slumber for that picture are the same people, a lot of them, that are masturbating in pornography at home and going to church the next day? They're the same people. The epidemic is not just immorality. It's hypocrisy on a, on a really bad level. Things have gotten so difficult in our country. A recent Gallup poll I read, it says same-sex marriage has reached a record of 70% in the United States. In other words, 70% of the country says, yes, we think it's good. 70% of our country. In other words, a good percentage of people who say I love Jesus are in church every Sunday. And some of you are here in this room. I'm, I'm not here to beat you up or condemn you. I'm here to say, do you, do you understand that this is contrary to what Jesus says is right and natural? 
it, it's, it's not me saying I'm superior to you because I'm not gay and I don't support it. Not that at all. I'm saying that, that pride goes before destruction. As soon as I think that I know better than God and in my haughty spirit choose a worldly philosophy or what I feel over what he says, destruction is coming. Do you understand? And that's where we're at as a country. Destruction is coming when 70% of the country says yes and amen to sodomy. That's the part that's so difficult. It's like, it's not, it's, we're not saying no to love, right? Did you see this picture? That's, when I see that, that's heartbreaking to me when I go, Make a Mary love again? Love is sodomy? Love is teenagers having surgery that changes their sexual identity? That's lo- Accepting that is love? That, that just doesn't sound, doesn't sound right. It doesn't sound natural. It doesn't sound holy or pure. It, it, is there an elation and excitement in that? Absolutely. When someone comes out of the closet, so to speak, and they've lived their life hiding certain feelings that they're having towards the same sex, and they come out, there's, there, there's so much oppression. Instead of getting set free by God, they come in and find a community that accepts them and praises them, and they feel so loved. It's a pseudo-love. It's not real. Understand. Okay? When I was doing $200 a day of cocaine and smoking dope like cigarettes every day, hey, Dave, you here. What you carry, man? What you got? I felt loved. I mean, it was like the, my best friends in the world. It felt so real and amazing until after I got saved and found out it wasn't real. But it sure felt that way. And that's what happens when someone gets in this community. It feels so accepting and you ready? Loving. But as there's a Christ, there is an antichrist. As there's miracles, there's fake miracles. As there's a love of God, there's a cold false love, a fake love that the enemy produces, counterfeit. And that's what he's using with the promise of fulfillment in a rainbow to deceive the masses, you see. And now the tip of a spear of our government is falling into this. I could not help but think of Romans 1 that says, professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into the image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And worshiped and served the creator rather than the creator who was forever blessed. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burn in their lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, pride, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. How prophetic that is from Romans chapter one, almost 2,000 years ago. We, America makes Rome and Sodom and Gomorrah look, look like choir boys, makes it look like a purity contest. We, we, we're so much worse than Sodom and Gomorrah and Rome put together today in this country. But when you're in the Christian bubble, you don't see it. And dare you say anything about it, or you will come under persecution. And that's how we've gotten where we're at. A recent Gallup poll, another one, 2021 in February, reports 5.6 of Americans identify as LGBTQ. That's up from 4.5% based on the company's 2017 data. In 2012, where it began, it was 3.5. So it's it's growing. Listen to this. This little heady in knowledge, but it's, it's worth the research. It says, the poll found that Half of the LGBTQ adults, 54.6, identify as bisexual, about a quarter, 24.5 is gay, 11.7 is lesbian, 11.3 is transgender, all additional as queer or some gender 
type of other gender. Respondents could give responses bringing a total to 100%. Notably, the generational group that has the highest percentage, listen, of people who identify as LGBTQ is the youngest generation, Z, from 1997 to 2002. So the large majority who are entering into this type of mindset are people from Generation Z, 97, 2002. One of the main reasons LGBT identification has been increasing over time is that younger generations are more likely to consider themselves to being something other than heterosexual. Now, how, how did we have this exponential increase of this mindset that is the Bible calls unnatural. October 23rd, 2020, our president said, quote, if your eight-year-old child says they want to transgender themselves to make life easier, they have the right to transition and there is no reason for you to deny it. All that has to happen is a child has to come into a counselor's office and say, I, I just feel lost in a room full of people. I don't feel comfortable around people. I have a hard time sleeping. A couple other very common diagnoses, and you will be diagnosed with gender dysphoria. The teenagers, this is what's going on today all around us outside of our Christian bubble that we're not aware of. After that happens, the child will qualify and they'll be prescribed with FDA-approved puberty-blocking drugs and cross-sex hormones, all being prepared for sexual surgery. Now, we have a governor in Florida right now who's trying to pass a law that surgery for minors changing their sex is illegal. But all around us, amen. Amen. Ron DeSantis for president. Sorry, just had to put that in there. <laughs> I know I'll get an email on that one. <laughs> but it's like it, it, the world has gone completely insane. I saw an article recently which blew my mind of a teacher's union for transgenderism. Look at this. This is something that was approved in Scotland for 80% of the schools where this one person go around playing different people for transitionism goes around to 80% of the schools in Scotland and one of the, the, the characters she plays is a transgender female, Jesus, coming back. And this is approved in the schools. And you go, man, I'm just... Dave, I'm so glad that that's just Scotland and we don't kind of have that problem going on here. Anybody ever heard of the show called Arthur? If you've got little kids, sure you do. This was from a season premiere. These three pics right here where Arthur goes to the wedding of his teacher Mr. Ratner and, Fi and they're all excited, like, who is he going to marry? Who's he going to marry? And then there's this one girl he's with, and, and they find out, oh, that's his sister. Well, then who's he marrying? And then they see, oh, he's marrying a guy. And they're like, that's great. These are four and five-year-olds watching this today. If you're not familiar with Arthur, how about, how about the show called Blue's Clues? This one, this one's incredible. Where in Blues Clues, this was just a couple weeks ago for the season premiere, where they have a drag queen come out to celebrate Pride Month, and singing this song. It's all about rejoicing in love with two daddies and a child, and two mommies and a child. And didn't so you didn't know this, right? It's just, it's crazy. This is all around us, man. Disney has come out with a six-series quick movie called Launchpad, and their newest release, 20-minute film, take a look at this, called Little Princess. Basically, this little 20-minute quick film in the series called Launchpad, about transitionism, is about the father who opposes the same-sex attraction and how what a bad dad he really is. 
Now this, what I'm sharing with you, it's the tip of the iceberg. Now, so for anyone in here who's going, I'm just struggling with same-sex attraction. First of all, let me say to you, I've got a word for you. And we're going a little longer today, but I haven't taught in almost seven weeks. So you're just going to have to deal with it. Because <laughs> i got a couple things to share with you that you need to hear. You need to hear this today. I promise you, you've got to hear this. Stand to your feet right now. Stand to your feet and say this out loud. Go, I need to hear this. <laughs> okay, now you can sit down. Hopefully you believe that. All right. If you're here today and you're going, but I'm having same-sex attraction, Pastor Dave, and, and, and I'm having difficulty with it. You know, one musician I talked to recently that's been at a school of worship, not revealed, by the way, a different school, where they would take in interns. The, the majority of interns that were Levites, trained to lead worship churches, the majority that were caught in sexual sin was a homosexual in nature. This is recent. This is, this is what's going on all around us. So know that you're not alone in this spiritual battle. Make no mistake, it's a spiritual battle. Just like the person who's struggling with greed, with lying, with anger, it, it, it's, it's all connected to a spirit of this world that take you away from knowing how much God loves you. It really is. You've been lost in identity, and, and, and you could go, who are you to say that? It, it's the Lord saying it to you. It's his word. It's, it's not my opinion. I'm not, I, my opinion doesn't help you. I can't help you. The son who seeks you can help you. If you're willing to humble yourself and, and repent of pride. It's not a time to celebrate pride. It's a time to celebrate humility. And humbling yourself before God and saying, God, I can't do this without you. And, I'm try, and if, you're, if you're listening to what I'm saying right now, know this. God brought you here to listen today. God has you online to listen today for one reason, the same reason he talked to the Pharisees, because he loves you. Amen. How awesome is that? The parable of the lost sheep is the son is seeking you. The parable of the lost coin is the spirit finds you. Oh my gosh, this is so incredible. Look at this, Luke 15. It says, what woman having 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together saying, rejoice with me for I have found the peace which was lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God when one sinner repents. Now, Jesus is saying this to the Pharisees, right? The Pharisees, the Pharisees had a saying. They called sinners the people of the land and Pharisees people of the law. And the people of the land, they, believed, they had a saying that all of heaven will rejoice at the destruction of one sinner. That was a saying that Pharisees had. All of heaven will rejoice at the destruction of one sinner. And here Jesus is saying all of heaven rejoices at the repentance of one sinner. I mean, he's really trying to reach those that are caught up in pride. Why? Because he, because you're listening, good. He loves them. He's reaching them. And he's trying to say, hey, listen, if you're lost, you can be found. You might have lost your identity, who you are, but it can be found. You might go, what's the big deal with the coin? I mean, 10 coins, big deal. I mean, it's probably a drachma, a day's wage, 10 days wages. That's, I mean, that's kind of significant, but it's nothing to like freak out about, right? But see, what was significant is the culture of that day. A young bride would take 10 coins as her dowry and wear them on her head as a sign that she is married as her identity. You can't wear just nine. What's the point? That when you lose your way of who you are, the Holy Spirit will search every dark area and bring light into it and deliver you. Do you understand? The Holy Spirit, he is searching. Oh, I love this powerful word in Proverbs. It says, wisdom calls aloud outside. She, and I love this representation of the feminine side of God and the heart to reach and to seek and to find. I love this. She raises her voice in the open squares. She cries out in the chief concourses at the opening of the gates in the city. She speaks her words. How long will you simple ones love your simplicity? For scorners delight in their scorning and fools hate 
acknowledge, turn at my rebuke and surely I will pour out my spirit on you. I will make my words known to you. The Holy Spirit, he's the one who delivers someone from their spiritual amnesia. When they've lost their identity, they don't know who they are. Let me tell you what, as soon as you humble yourself that you're lost, the Holy Spirit comes. You don't see him, but he's there. And he comes and brings light in those areas of darkness. The Bible calls them strongholds. I think something, I'm believing the truth is a lie and a lie is the truth. And the Holy Spirit can come in and set you free from that. You don't have to live your life going, I'm going to struggle my whole life with same-sex attraction. That is a lie from the pit of hell. You were not created that way. I know the world's telling you that, but it's not true. It's a lie. And the enemy's trying to have you double down with the world pride and a community around you that celebrates your departure from the good shepherd who loves you. The Holy Spirit is knocking. Oh, I mean, he's, the Holy Spirit's searching. I love this passage, lots of scripture. 1 Corinthians 2, it says, the Spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man who is within him? Even so, no no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. The Holy Spirit is the one that comes and sets you free of all the lies the world is telling you who you are and who you're not. It's like no sermon can heal a broken mind. And there's a lot of broken minds. Do you know how many people that are suffering with suicide tendencies because they had a sex change operation? Look up the stats. I'm not going to look them up for you. You look them up. It's horrifying. When you see the carnage of everything that's going on of this demonic onslaught on our world that our country has just championed in an incredible way, when you look at it, you go, man, only God can come and deliver. And believe you me, he can I know people that have been deceived by this strong, oppressive spirit blanketing our country, and they've been set free. They're not living a life going, man, I'm just, I'm just destined to suffer. I'll suffer. I, I have one brother I know. He's been married for 25 years. I met him back at a church back in the early 90s I pastored, and he came. He was homosexual, struggled with it. News was out, hey, you were born that way. He's been married for two decades, happily in love. I could tell you so many stories like that. And there's so many people that get caught up in this lie that if you'll just, if you're struggling with this, if you'll just open your heart and humble yourself as a child to go, maybe this is wrong because science does say it's unnatural, right? It, 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 there's nothing prolific, procreative about it. It doesn't glorify the creator at all. So maybe something's really wrong. And instead of using a bunch of self-righteous Christians as my excuse to judge God, which is what happens. I'm going to consider that maybe God is one who rejoices when he finds me. And maybe he can find my lost coin. And maybe even though my innocence was stolen when someone sexually abused me as a child, maybe God can restore that too. Maybe he loves me enough to come and set me free from that. And see, that's the heart of this final parable that's called the parable of the prodigal son. But I'm going to rename it today and get myself in trouble once again. It should be called the parable of the perfect father. Because that's really what the parable is about. Now, while we don't have time to really go through the whole thing, here, here's me just land the plane hard. This is it. There was a man, a perfect father. He had two sons, and one of them, in his pride and his arrogance, says, this is what I'll do. I'll go to my dad, and I'll say, paraphrase, I wish you were dead so I could have all your stuff. But since you're not, can you just give it to me anyway? And the father does what I never would have done. He gives it to him. Because this father understood before he could ever get his son back, he had to first acknowledge he was lost. He was lost way before he asked the question, right? Just in denial, like some of you in this room, denial. You're lost. You're not even realizing you're lost. The father had the wisdom to know, I believe, and he does, to know he's going to give you resources and opportunity to get things so bad in your life because that's what it's going to take, like it did for this young man who went off and spent everything the father gave him with sexual sin. 
prostitutes until he was worn out. No one wanted anything to do with him anymore. The whole LGBTQ crowd was gone. No one was championing him anymore because he had no resources. So now someone who was a Jew is working the worst job in the world for a Jew, working with pigs, longing to look like the food that they're eating. And, go, I, 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 and that was enough for him to go, I'm coming to my senses. The story goes on where the son comes home to repent expecting to be a servant in the father's house. And I love the picture of the perfect father that runs to the prodigal, don't you? Because God seeks us out. And he's running to him. Oh, man, he doesn't say, what have you done? How much money do you have left? I can't believe you broke my heart. No, man, he's running to him to protect him from all the self-righteous people around him might want to stone him. Some of us in this room would have he runs and he covers him, throws his arms around him, kisses his face. Man, this was the story I read 35 years ago in a jail cell that just wrecked me. Because the Holy Spirit was searching out every dark part in my head that was lying to me that God didn't want anything to do with me. When I read that, it floored me, man. Broke me into a zillion pieces, which is what needed to happen. I was lost and man, I was found. I had my 10 coins, hallelujah. <laughs> it was glorious, you know. It was like, in this story really, it's like, if you go look over Keisha's desk, there's like a picture of the prodigal son that my dad gave that to me when I was like 19 years old. You know, just the celebration of like, son, I remember. I remember when, when you got back from Alabama in prison and I saw you that night. I, I remember, oh my gosh, it's so fresh, right? But God, his love draws us to that place to go, I can be found though I was lost, though I was hopeless. There's still hope, you know? Many times, real hope isn't found until you get to complete hopelessness in your lostness. That's what happened to him. That's what happened to me. That's what happened to so many of you in this room. That, but that's here. That's what's crazy. Thing. That's not what the story's about. But it's important you know that so you understand what really was taking place is in verse 25 where it says, now the older son was in the field and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what these things meant. And he said to them, your brother has come home and because he was received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and he would not go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. Now, who's he talking to? The Pharisees. I have never transgressed your commandment at any time. We know that's not true. He's lost and doesn't know it. You hear this? And yet, you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, not my brother, I don't accept that he's born again. I don't accept that God could redeem him and forgive him for what he's done. He's not my brother. This son of yours came who has devoured your livelihood with harlots. You killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, son, you are always with me. And all that I have is yours. It is right that we should make merry and be glad because your brother was dead and is alive again. Say it out loud, church. Was lost and is found. Glory. He wasn't getting it. He just wasn't understanding any more than I was sitting there at that table about the mercy of God. We've got such a narrow vision of the word of God. I asked someone recently, I said, why is it that if we ask the father what John 3, 16 means, he says mercy. It's about mercy. But if we ask the church, it's about judgment unless you do the right thing. Now, you want to argue with me, I know, and say, but it says you have to believe, don't have judgment. Yes, I know, I know. Just like the band knew, he knows that to put the, the picture up of Jesus and the Mohawk with the transgender person. They know that too. But what we forget about is John 3, 17, where it says, for God did not send his son to the world to condemn the world, but that through the world, through him, it might be saved. We leave that part out. 
Aren't you so grateful the Holy Spirit seeing you in your sin and your rebellion, your hypocrisy, didn't shun you and say, look at you and go, disgusting. So unholy. Aren't you so grateful that Jesus in heaven in his glorified body didn't look at this world and say, disgusting, heartbreaking, lay it bare with fire. Instead, leaves a real 99, leaves heaven and everything for the one, which if you're lost and you've been found, then you have the joy of looking in the mirror and going, I'm the one. Matter of fact, try it on for size. Say it, I'm the one. Yeah, and when you get that, Oh my gosh, then you get the Father's joy going on. When you get the Father's joy going on, you're free. Because when the Son sets you free, come on. You're free indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.